Korean's fight against home rule. The Ban Valley Volunteers. Notes on the 3rd Korean Battalion of the North Londonderry Regiment, Ulster Volunteer Force. Now, upon the advent of the first Home Rule Bill, that's way back in 1886, Irish Unionism in partnership with the Orange Order canvassed Orange Lodges across the entirety of Ireland. Now, the purpose of this canvas was to establish the strength of feeling against the idea of Home Rule, but more so the degree to which Orange men in particular would be prepared to go to prevent its imposition. Now, during that period, um, and the nature of the two-house parliamentary system, there never was a possibility of Home Rule really coming to pass. But to help ensure their cause was heeded, the muster rule of an Orange army was leaked to English newspapers. It was largely a, a paper exercise. However, the detailed organisational role was impressive. There were four divisions subdivided into brigades. Now, within the 4th Brigade of the 3rd, otherwise known as the Mid-Ulster Division, were the Coleraine men. They were named the 1st Regiment of Sir Harvey's Volunteers. And its nine companies it was said, were said to have mustered 570 volunteers and had a reserve of 297. Almost 30 years before the Home Rule Crisis, Korean was acknowledging its willingness to use force against Home Rule if necessary. Just seven years later, another organisation emerged to lobby against Home Rule. Um, this time in the form of the Ulster Defence Union. A 600-man assembly was elected from across Ulster, with each parliamentary constituency electing a number of delegates in, ratio, um, in relation to their unionist electorate. The 38 North Derry delegates included in their number included 11 Coleraine men. Um, and these, just to, to give an idea of some of the personalities, Stuart Hunter, the Reverend James Smith, William Ackles, Hunt Leach, Drummond Grant, Thomas Carson, Joseph Carson, and the Reverend O'Hare. Few of them realised that some 20 years later, they would again be involved in another new movement against Home Rule. On the 8th of January 1912, over eight months before the signing of the Ulster Covenant, the County Londonderry Grand Master of the Orange Institution attended a grand Unionist meeting in Coleraine. Captain Watt stated to the gathered audience unambiguously that Home Rule must be resisted and if, needed, if needs dictated that resistance should be by force of arms. At the same meeting, visiting Unionist MP for North Armagh, William Moore, told the Coleraine crowd that if the time came for organised defence against invasion of their constitutional rights as citizens of the United Kingdom, no one was going to have time to ask for gun licences. While drilling was undoubtedly being carried out in the area by that date, indeed RIC intelligence detailed its un un unsubstantiated belief that drilling near Coleraine had been happening as early as September 1911, a full year before the Covenant. Their intelligence did not, however, identify a particularly high level of militancy. During the months ahead, this would rapidly change. Now, in the aftermath of the Ulster Covenant, the Ulster Unionist Council took this decision to form the Ulster Volunteer Force with the motivation several in number. Carson and Gregg recognised the need to band together the many different bodies currently drilling and create a central control. But they also realised that the PR and propaganda uses of a mass citizen army against Home Rule would be invaluable. County committees were appointed to oversee the organisation, funding and equipping of the force in their own areas, with the North Derry area being given county status in its own right by virtue of its size. 
A 23rd of April 1913 committee listing includes in its number Captain Horace Gawson of Rock House Port Stewart, Canon Cunningham of Bally Rasheen Rectory, Andrew McFeeters of Bridge Street, Coleraine, and William Jackson of Castle Rock. Drilling was increasing swiftly, and by August the RAC believed that about um, 700 men were drilling in County Londonderry under the auspices primarily of Unionist clubs and Orange Lodges. There is little doubt that there were some within local unionism thinking ahead in terms of ornaments, armaments as well. Um, it's actually we're, we're very, very close to the anniversary of one such incident. On Tuesday, the 24th of June, 1913, a steamer that arrived at Coleraine was boarded by customs. Within its cargo, the steamer, the Lily, contained two wooden cases that had been shipped from Newcastle on Tyne. Each case, seven long, seven feet long and two and a half feet in width and diameter. Each was filled with 30 rifles and bayonets described as being of Italian design. The structure of the Ulster Volunteer Force was one that was continually evolving. Uh, and some areas were slower to organise than others. RIC intelligence estimated the North Derry constituency to have just 1,496 Ulster Volunteers in September 1913. Captain James Craig visited the town um, on Friday the 17th of October. And yet again, there was this total lack of ambiguity within the sentiments expressed. Craig stated clearly that any Dublin Parliament would have a 100,000 strong army to deal with. Craig's visit had to stimulate more growth in the body. And just a few months later, an official County Londonderry UVF return of numbers dated the 9th of January 1914 details a North Derry Division Volunteer Force numbering 2,414 volunteers. Now within this we have the Coleraine District that was divided into five areas, um, totaling 341. Uh, and the, the five areas were North, South, East, West and, and Quilly. Articlave and Castle Rock in the Ballywildrick District uh, were noted as having 51 men. And the Port Stewart district, composing of Perch, Port Stewart and Burnside, was said to have 160 or 106 men combined. Now this North Derry division eventually was reconfigured as the North London Derry Regiment, composed of three battalions. By May the 31st, 1914, the RIC estimate of its total strength had increased to 3,305. But at their peak in, in June, um, official documents, official UVF headquarters documents, had the three battalions combined, numbering as 3,324 men. The 1st Battalion was known as the Fawn Valley Battalion, centred on Eglinton. The 2nd Battalion was the Roe Valley Battalion, with headquarters in Limavady. The 3rd Battalion was the largest in the regiment, with 1,304 volunteers. Known as the Bon Valley Battalion, the unit's base was in Colerain, and it was composed of seven companies. Now, it was initially under the command of Port Stewart's Captain Horace Gasson. Um, but the 3rd Battalion Command was taken over by Captain Harvey, Harvey Ronald Bruce of Downhill. Now, this Bruce family were of Scottish descent, of or Scottish origin, descendants of 15, 15th century massive landowner and famous figure Sir Edward Bruce, settling in Ulster in the middle of the 17th century. Born in December 1872, Harvey Bruce was educated at Eton 
and he obtained his captain title in service with the Irish Guards, with whom he received the Queen's Medal with two clasps, the King's Medal for two clasps, both for service during the South African War, the Boer War, from 1899 to 1902. During the Great War, he would go on to achieve the rank of Major while serving with the 17th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles. He died in tragic circumstances in 1824 when he fell over railings in Eastburn in the south coast of England during a thunderstorm, just as an aside. Among his support staff was his adjutant, Samuel Willis, a de facto really second in command of the battalion. By 1914, the Donegal-born Willis had been the Master of Mathematics in Korean Academical Institution for 18 years, and he was regarded as a very popular, well-known figure in Korean. Upon the outbreak of the Great War, Willis enlisted, and in November 1914 was appointed as a captain in the 14th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, famously the Young Citizen Volunteers. On the 1st of July 1916, Captain Willis was reported captured by Germans and missing. He was later declared killed in action. Now, quartermaster of this battalion, overseeing its, its equipment and logistics, was William McAleese. Combined, these, this headquarters staff oversaw seven companies. A company was Articlave, under commander... William Jackson. B Company was under W.A. Patterson and that was deemed the Volunteer and Lack Company. Now C right through to F Company were all designated um, Korean companies. C Kai Officer in Command was R.S. Knox. D Company, F. Glenn. E Company, H.A. Anderson. F Company, W.J. McKenna. G Company covered the Port Stewart area and was commanded initially by Captain Gasson, previously mentioned, and then it was taken over by the president of the Port Stewart Unionist Club, Henry O'Neill, JP. There was a Korean mounted troop, um, the Korean Horse, and it was officered by Captain Frey and a troop commander, D.H. Christie. The battalion also had its own nursing and ambulance corps, cycling corps, signalling corps and motor dispatch riders. A post house for the 3rd Battalion was located at Eastley on Adelaide Avenue and it was under the charge of postmistress Mrs Leslie Smith. Um, that office had a, had a code designation of CR that appeared on all communications. From mid-1913, right through to the beginning of the Great War and indeed beyond, the activities of the Korean volunteers could be read about almost weekly in the local papers. Route marches um, and drills were the most common activity, but um, there were also inspections and camps, fundraising, concerts and events and, and church services. On the evening of Friday the 25th of July 1913, the local MP... Hugh T. Barry paid a visit to the Korean Division of the Ulster Volunteer Force um, at its headquarters, or at its said to be headquarters at Waterside. In a lengthy speech to the men, he outlined how every one of them was animated by a desire to kill Home Rule. And he considered them worthy descendants of the men who in 1688. And of course, a reference to the siege of Londonderry, who saved Ulster. Now, despite structure not being fully finalised, what is described as the Korean Company, Ulster Volunteers Force, over 300 strong, were presented with colours on the 8th of August 1913. Now, all information um, so far uncovered would suggest that it was the first ever presentation of colours to any Ulster volunteer unit. They were the gift of the North Derry MP and his wife, um, Mrs Barry, who actually passed the standard 
over to the Korean men in front of the manor house. Um, after they had proceeded there from their drill hall on the water side, headed by the Kjarsen's young defenders, flute band. There to cheers, she told them that she had no fear that the Korean company would, if they should be called on, make sacrifices for the cause which was so dear to their hearts. The colours were accepted on behalf of the company by Andrew McFeeter, who stated that they would be carried aloft and always protected before handing them over to the standard bearer. Now in the process McFeeter is said to have entreated to have appealed to the standard bearer to protect them with his life if the necessity arose. There was actually another colour presentation for the 3rd Battalion before the end of the year. Um, and that this time this was for the Articlave Company. The venue for that occasion was the Pavilion in Castle Rock where 80 local volunteers said to be from three sections of the company um, had marched from their drill hall. There was refreshments provided by the wife of com company commander William Jackson who afterwards was said to have this delivered a rising speech to the men. The occasion ended with Jackson cutting the cords of the flag and revealing it to all present. And that colour was described as being a large union flag upon the centre of which the company name was laddered. It was actually purchased, not wasn't a donation, it was purchased from subscriptions from the actual volunteers of the Articlave Company themselves. The largest gathering the battalion participated in was on the 16th of April 1914, when the entirety of the North Londonderry Regiment and the City of Derry Regiment were reviewed by Sir Edward Charson at Drina, um, Limavada. There were an estimated 4,000 volunteers in attendance. The local men were also involved in arguably the most famous event of the entire period, the arrival of the Clyde Valley at Lorne. The Belfast newsletter following the 24th of April 1914 event, the event of that night, reported that the local companies all turned out every available man for the mobilisation that evening, which would soon, they stated, be world news. Motor vehicles were recorded as passing through Coleraine at 3.30am um, with the local men only ceasing operating at 4am. In late July, the general officer in command of the Ulster Volunteers himself, Sir George Richardson, travelled to the North West and in his journey reviewed a local contingent of UVF who had met him at Coleraine train station. Richardson told them the crisis time was imminent. He also took the opportunity to thank the local force for its contribution to the Lauren gun running, an event he said would go down in history. A typical church event was like that in early May. The volunteer and lack volunteers met at Volunteer Orange Hall and marched in formation to Dunbo Presbyterian Church where a sermon was given to them by, by the Reverend J.G. Kirsch. And that church on the day was recorded as being so crowded um, that many were unable to gain admission. But meanwhile, route marches were almost weekly occurrences, such as that in Coleraine itself on the 16th of May 1914. The four Coleraine companies gathered that evening at the Diamond, where they were then under the leadership of the battalion officer in command, Bruce, and the adjutant, um, Samuel Willis, both of whom were mounted. At 7pm, almost 400 accompanied volunteers, accompanied by their band, marched to Port Stewart by the Bally Sally Road, being met en route with the, by the Port Stewart company, who joined in their ranks. The biggest mobilisation of solely this Ban Valley Battalion took place on the 4th of June at Town Downhill Castle um, near Rock, Castle Rock, home of this Bruce dynasty. The entire battalion had been ordered to mobilise at short notice 
for what they were told was particular service. Uh, and around 1,000 men responded to the instruction despite being totally oblivious to the purpose of their mobilization. The Korean volunteer and lack men arrived by train while the Port Stewart and Articlave units joined them, um, having walked two downhill. The actual purpose of the night had been to carry out a test exercise that was based on the premise that an enemy was advancing on Downhill Castle. Mock warfare. The men were divided into separate bodies and deployed throughout the area. Sentries were posted and scouts and cavalry patrolled the grounds. The elaborate exercise came to an end after three hours, after which the 700 Korean volunteers returned by train, and the Port Stewart men actually travelled home by boat. The commander of the entirety of the Derry Division, that is the City of Derry Regiment, the North London Derry Regiment, and the South London Derry Regiment, and all their um, junior battalions, uh, Major Ross Smith, was present and oversaw the entire proceedings. On Sunday the 4th of July, um, again around 1,000 volunteers attended the home of Hugh Barry MP, the manor at his home, the manor house, for a drumhead service. The volunteers had again formed up in the diamond prior to the service and marched to the manor house watched by massive crowds lining the route. Um, alongside a crowd of this, about 1,000 additional spectators, all present participated in a service officiated over by the battalion chaplain, chaplains Canon Armstrong from Castle Rock, Canon Dudley from Coleraine, and the Reverend Moore from Ringsend. The first appearance of weapons on Coleraine streets came on Thursday 9th of July. When a hundred man guard of honour from C Company attended at the railway station fully armed for the arrival of Walter Long MP. Long was in attendance to speak in the area to speak at the annual 12th of July commemorations scheduled to be held in Garva. There was an additional speaking engagement for him in Port Rush on Tuesday the 14th of July in the form of a mass rally said to be for loyalists from counties Londonderry and Antrim and on that occasion a representative force of 500 men from the 3rd Battalion was present including a mounted troop who escorted pride of place the main speakers. Um, the Right Honourable Walter Long in the aftermath actually sent a telegram to Coleraine stating Captain Bruce, Battalion Headquarters, Coleraine, congratulate you most heartily upon splendid appearance and behaviour of your command today. Long. Just a few days before the United Kingdom's entry into what would become the Great War, the General Officer commanding the Ulster Volunteers again reviewed the Coleraine men. The 23rd of July event at Somerset Domain saw a march past and several manoeuvres performed by the Coleraine companies. After which Richardson remarked that they were well drilled, officered and fit for any service at any time. Now by this stage the entirety of the Coleraine Ulster Volunteer Corps was fully outfitted with hats, bandoliers and putties. The occasion was used as an opportunity for a group photo of all of the battalion officers, company commanders, half company commanders and special section leaders. Upon the outbreak of war, many Korean men would embark on a new venture. The army battalion of choice, primarily for the local volunteers, was the 10th Battalion Royal Enniskillings. Under the command of the Derry UVF Division Commander Ross Smith, the unit soon was known as the Durries. Most of the local men ended up in C Company of this new battalion. Some joined for the good of Ulster. 
some for the good of Ireland and the Empire. Some wanted escape from the drudgery and hard labour in the factories and on the farms, and some simply sought adventure, filled with romantic ideas of seeing new sights and feeling new experiences. In truth, there was very little romantic about what many would see and experience. Eventually, over 170 names would be listed on Korean War Memorial alone of local men who fell on the fields of battle far from home. So ends tonight's presentation on the Ban Valley Volunteers. Thanks for joining us. Thank you to North Ulster Act for giving an opportunity to share this very important history. The Bygone Days Forgotten History Project is has now into lecture 15 in our series. You can see all of these lectures by simply going to the Bygone Days Facebook page. Um, you can pick the videos option or alternatively just type in fb.me slash bygone dot days dot history slash live and you'll get a full list of all the videos now just within the last um, recently we've also um, got a YouTube channel up and running um, all of our videos um, to date are on this YouTube channel um, including a couple I think that have actually been were deleted from Facebook so it might be of interest to take a look at it look at it if you just go on to YouTube and and search for bygone days history channel it, it'll come up in the options please don't forget we have a massive range of information booklets out there um, that you can examine explore um, this important forgotten history. We now have 38 titles. The latest edition came just last week um, with a booklet on the Boyne Obelisk, the very famous Boyne Obelisk blown to bits in 1923. We have 38 titles covering a vast range of subjects across the Ulster Volunteers and the Orange Institution across the length and breadth of Ireland. Um, uh, including outside Ulster, in particular outside Ulster. In this year that it is, it's also a wee booklet on the B-Men. Um, there's a booklet on the, the 36th Ulster Division and a booklet on the, the Strong Dynasty. So please, if you're interested in any of these booklets, um, please contact me directly via the Facebook page or email or send me a text. This is all not for profit. They're £4 each, including UK postage. We have two upcoming presentations. Next week, the 23rd, not the 23rd, as, our, as our, our slide says, the 23rd of June next week, our presentation is entitled A Forgotten Order, The Lost Orange Heritage of Leinster, Munster and Connacht. Now, this presentation will be taking place in conjunction junction with a Republic of Ireland history organisation called Trasna Natera, who do nightly, every night they have been doing live online lectures. And we have decided that we to do this collaboration with this group to try and bring this history to a wider audience. And this presentation of Forgotten Order is going to look at a summary of Orangeism the history of Orangeism outside Ulster, it's fascinating history. Every county of Ireland at one time had its significant contingent of orange men. From Galway to Clare, from Carlow to Waterford, Waxford, Wicklow, right through the Midlands of Westmeath, Leash, Kings County um, and Longford, Sligo, Mayo, all of them had their own orange men, and we'll hear more about them next week. Then the following week, we're actually staying um, like Coleraine in County Londonderry. And that night, we will be discussing again, or looking at again, um, with the facilitation of North Ulster Act, the Maiden City Volunteers. 
the City of Derry Regiment, Ulster Volunteer Force. Thanks again for joining us. Um, please get in touch with any feedback and let's all try to keep exploring, reminding um, and educating on our history. History should be explored. History should be discovered. History should be learned about. It most certainly should not be demolished off plinths. Thank you and good evening.